between Hamas and Israel before, the last one in 2014. This is escalating quickly and is taking terms previously unseen. And Paris Daniel Esselin is in the Israel the sound right now. Hi, Elsa. Can someone turn off their mic? a surge of really intense airstrikes and rocket fire. Can you just bring us? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Joan McCabe. I am the Director of Operations for the MFA Visual Narrative Program. We have several classes to talk about tonight. A little introduction to the program. We are a full MFA program that is a low residency model, meaning we uh, have three summer sessions on campus in, at SVA and then interspersed with two academic years of online work. And it's an unusual model and it works for, works for many people. And what we concentrate on is a combining visual expression with, um, with creative writing. So that can be any kind of media you like. We, work, we have students working in VR, in comics, in illustrated novels, in graphic design, in infographics, in game design. Um, we have some puppeteers, we have set decorators, we have even engineers and EMTs come to this program. So we have a wide variety of, of kinds of people that come and that's also the strength of the program. Um, we were super excited to talk to you about the summer online classes we have. I'm especially excited to have two alumni teaching uh, this summer who graduated from the program last year. And then we'll also talk about the Rizzo classes that are coming up as well. And the Rizzo access that is available once you have taken a class. Um, and I wanted to take this moment to introduce you to Pan Terzis, who is the manager of the Rizzo Lab, who uh, was with us from the beginning of the Rizzo Lab, co-founded it with um, our chair, Nathan Fox. And um, he's gonna be taking you through the evening. Pan is an artist, printer and publisher based in New York. His work has been published by Nieves, Fantagraphics, Landfill Editions, Vice Magazine, and others. And he's been exhibited across the US and internationally, including at the Elizabeth Foundation, Printed Matter Inc., the Swiss Institute, the Para Museum in Istanbul, Andreas Melos Presents in Athens, Greece, and the Greek Consulate in New York. He has worked with brands and labels such as American Apparel, Digitaria, Elsewhere Space, I Bodega, McDonald's, Lurid Records, and others. Terzis is also the founder of the Rizzo Press, Mega Press. His artist books, zines, and print editions are in the collection of the MoMA Library, the Brooklyn Museum, the New York Public Library, and the collection of Stanford University, among others. He teaches printmaking and Rizograph printing at SVA and is a co-founder of the SVA Rizzo Lab. Take it away, Pan, in that very relaxed picture you have of yourself. It's fantastic. Thank you, Joan. And, uh... Hopefully, um, you know, you'll all be, um, you know, come away from, from this evening with a lot of um, possibilities for, for developing your own practice further um, in a relaxing way, um, but also a rigorous way. Um, before we get started, I want to introduce our other three faculty members that are going to be presenting their classes and speaking a bit about their work this evening. So first off, we have Susan, Suzanne Reese, who is introducing a new class this semester. She's a writer, illustrator, and visual essayist with an interest in non-sequential visual storytelling, poetry, comics, and book arts. She has also worked for many years as a professional copywriter and advertiser. Suzanne holds a BA in German language and literature, an MA in history of art, and earned her MFA in visual narrative from the School of Visual Arts. She was a Fulbright Scholar in Munich, Germany, and Whitney Research Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Her work has appeared in Rednik, Red Ink, Poetry, Comics, Delirious Hem, The Jupiter Review, and is forthcoming in No Tokens and O Reader. She recently completed a series of images for a prestige television series, currently in production to be used as part of the set decoration. Suzanne is currently at work on a long form visual narrative pro project about artist Luis Bourgeois. And then we have Ren McDonald, who is going to be teaching um, 
the mini comics class as he has since the summer of 2019. Ren is an illustrator and cartoonist based in Brooklyn, New York. He's the author of the cyberpunk epic uh, Sparks and dystopian revenge story Cyber Realm, as well as several other self-published mini comics, including his current series Precinct X99. He edits the genre-based comics anthology X Mag for Piao. He's worked with publications such as the New York Times, the New Yorker Vice, and Wired, and also recently worked on the Midnight Gospel for Netflix. And Sarah Shaw, um, who is a comics artist, illustrator, and visual arts educator who has lived and worked internationally for the past 10 years. She's a graduate of Pratt Institute's um, BFA Art and Design Education Program and the School of Visual Art MFA Visual Narrative Program. Her work has been exhibited in both domestic, domestic and international solo and group shows and often incorporates themes such as history, family, travel, adventure, and world cultures. Currently, she lives and draws in Boston, Massachusetts. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about the Rizzo Lab. I'm your host for the evening. As, as Joan mentioned, I'll be taking you through um, uh, the, the next hour, about hour, hour and a half or so, uh, talking about our classes, uh, the Rizzo Lab space um, and various related subjects. But I wanna talk a little bit first about um, the Rizzo Lab space itself. Um, the Rizzo Lab, normally um, we would be meeting, you know, under, in pre-pandemic times, we'd be, we'd be meeting in person. Um, we'd be kind of explaining what our space is all about. You might get a chance to see the, the print process. You might get to leave um, our space with a few goodies and takeaways like these color charts. Um, but, uh, you know, due to the magic of technology, we're able to meet with you um, wherever you are uh, virtually. And, um, then this of course is a Rezo graph. I'll try to kind of explain a little bit about what a Rezo is. Um, and it's been an interesting year and a half. Um, obviously the, the lab was founded in 2015 um, and we, you know, we've been growing ever since. Uh, when, the, when, you know, back in uh, March of 2020, we had to shut down and figure out how to keep the spirit um, of our space going um, while, while we were physically closed to the public. And the, the, the question was, how do, we, how do we maintain this community that we've built and um, this these just different educational um, you know, approaches that are centered around a process that is all about hands-on printing. So we launched a series of online classes, the Rizal Lab Remote Series, which we're gonna continue into this summer um, and uh, essentially the thing about risograph printing that you want to, that you need to um, understand is that it's, it's, a, it's a spot color based printing process. So using the principles of risograph printing, um, of, of spot color printing, um, you know, these online classes focus on everything that goes into the process apart from the actual print process, because a lot of it really is in the in the preparation and the the file the file prep and everything that, that you do before you actually touch a machine. So just to sort of um, set the stage, here's a few a few examples of some risograph prints. If you're not familiar with them, this is the work of Natalie Anderson, who was one of our artists in residence several years ago. You can see with just with this this palette um, of the these colors, she was able to, uh, to exponentially expand um, the, the range of colors by using various clever overlapping um, designs and, and, and various, uh, various overlapping colors to achieve secondary, tertiary, and other colors as well. Just a few examples of the kinds of results you can get with Rizzo Graph printing. I'll be going over um, a lot of you know, various other examples of this process. So um, just to sort of Give you a little bit of background on our space. We launched in 2015 um, with, uh, I had been working with Rizograph Printing for a number of years and I was approached by Nathan Fox, who's the chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program. He was interested in starting a space at SVA 
centered around this strange process um, that was not designed to be used by artists to, to, for publishing, for, for printmaking. But there was a phenomenon that had started that I'd been a part of um, where artists have been buying these machines and figuring out how to use them to, uh, to make work, to make print-based work that really took advantage of the beautiful and vibrant spot colors that this company um, happened to make, even though the main clients tend to be small businesses and offices and restaurants and things like that. So in 2015, we launched the Rezo Lab with two classes, um, both taught by me, one employee that happened to be me, um, and a small crew of enthusiastic but not very well informed um, student assistants. Uh, we continued to expand. We added a mini comics class previously taught by Patrick Crotty, um, publisher of Kiao Studios. We added um, a photo and graphics class. We added an artist and residence program. We added a number of boot camps and workshops for our graduate students so they could bypass the, uh, the requirement for um, taking a full class before being able to access our space. And we kept growing and growing. And so by the time, uh, by the time we, you know, we found ourselves in the spring of 2020, we had about 150 students that were accessing our space in one way or another, whether by taking a class, whether by paying the lab fee and accessing the space after, after they had already completed the class. Um, and a, a sort of community had developed around the Rezo Lab, around the space on the 11th floor of a building uh, in, in, um, in Chelsea, in, in Manhattan. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a medium that can be utilized to reproduce the work of photographers, of illustrators, of cartoonists, of painters, poets. Um, and it's, you know, there's really a, a spontaneous community that rose one really wonderful thing about the space is that at the end of the semester, we have these events called the Print Slam, where we collect any work that students are interested in sharing. And um, we, the staff of the Rezo Lab sells the work. We have a one night pop-up event where um, you can see what everyone's been printing, all the students in classes, all the, all the students who have been, um, who have been printing uh, just on their own during the open lab access, the artists in residence. Um, and it's incredible the range of work that's created um, in a given semester. So it's, it's, uh, that's something that hopefully we can get back to at some point. Um, at any rate, we've, we've kept the spirit of the lab alive um, throughout the shutdown with these online classes. And we've actually been able to expand our community. We've had students from Morocco, from Spain, from Mexico City, um, from, uh, from Singapore, from France, really from all over the world, and of course, all over the US, and plenty of students also from New York. So these online classes that we're gonna be offering this summer, this summer is gonna be an interesting time because we're gonna be kind of transitioning. Um, and by the way, I wanna mention that we have a brand new website. Please make sure you check that out. Uh, I'll put that in the chat. It's uh, rezolab.sv.edu um, that we put together during, during the, the shutdown. We had a little bit more time, so we were able to work with One Trick Pony and take Rezo printed textures um, that decorate and sort of provide the skin for this um, site. We also have a gallery of student work. Um, there's a sort of endless scroll that we, of images, scans of Rezo prints that we keep adding that you can feel free to check out, see what the possibilities are. Um, so this summer, I'm happy to announce that we're gonna be opening to the public again in, in uh, July. So for, we're gonna have a compressed six week semester from July 6th to August 15th. And it's gonna be the beginning of the students who are local to the area who have taken our online classes who are now eligible to take a two day uh, eight hour, so basically two four hour sessions on a Saturday and Sunday um, course that, that sort of provides all of the hands on print training that goes into actually running and operating these machines. Having, um, having sort of studied either with Ren or I over the past year in one of these six week or eight week online classes, these students are now going to be able to apply 
that knowledge the actual print process and sort of um, complete their their understanding of what the reason the process is and what the capabilities are. Um, because really what this space is about is taking the, the work that's been done by some of the Rizzo pioneers, um, that is artists, designers, publishers, creative people who have taken these machines and figured out a way to apply the principles of printmaking, the principles of um, offset printing, all of these different ways to make images with spot colors um, to these machines. The lab basically is, we're trying to synthesize all that and also provide a space that is orderly and clean and um, and sort of you know uh, is is reliable um, and and well and well sort of put together. So that's those, that's sort of the idea with the lab this summer. Um, you know we'll be kind of transitioning back into um, into into sort of being open to the public. So the idea is if you do take an online class, um, we have four boot camps scheduled for the summer. The first one and the last one um, are both booked but we're also running we're running uh two other boot camps in the end of june the beginning of july and if you've taken an online class you're eligible if you um are enrolled in an online class um you're welcome to take the boot camp at the same time so that you can basically uh figure out the the actual physical hands-on print process um while getting the principles of the design under your belt. Um, and then by the fall, we're gonna be fully reopened with, uh, with our in-person classes as well as the online classes and the boot camps. So if you do take an online class this summer, you can also choose to take a boot camp in the fall and, um, and then you'll have access to the lab for six weeks, either for the first half of the semester or the second half of the semester. Um, so a little bit about my own work and background, how I got into research printing, I am a painter. Um, I do commercial illustration work and I make Rizzo prints. And my background is in printmaking. So I studied illustration, but I was also interested. I didn't want to just be a purely commercial artist. I was looking, I was kind of soaking up everything when I first came to New York to study art almost 20 years ago. Um, I was going to galleries. I was also looking at commercial designers and illustrators and where everything came together for me was in the world of printmaking. It really taught me about color, it taught me about process and discipline. Um, and it gave me a technique that I could use to, um, to really to make editions that could go out into the world and would be more accessible than making a work of fine art that would, you know, somebody would have to invest, you know, basically to make something that would be out of my own range. So that was, that was really huge for me in sort of starting out and getting my foot into multiple worlds, including both the fine art book world, the gallery world, the commercial illustration world, and the world of zines and com underground comics and uh, independent publishing. Um, as far as printmaking, I eventually, you know, started using it more to make, to scale up and make installation work and sort of use it as a painting tool. But when I first discovered risograph printing, that sort of changed everything for me. I remember, I had a friend, I'd been involved in various, you know, various different overlapping art worlds in New York. And it was about 2009, 2010, I had a friend who um, knew I was a printmaking freak and knew I was into all these processes and I used them for, for different, in different ways. And I was making books and I was working with different publishers, making small, small editions. Um, and he'd gotten hold of this something called a risograph, which he described in an automated screen printer and I, I couldn't picture it. I sort of imagined like a, a box with a crank on the side and, you know, water and paint spilling out and getting on my shoes. Um, you know, something really rickety, something that maybe, maybe would stink of diesel with, uh, you know, with, with sort of a, a mechanism. Um, either that or maybe some kind of a printing robot. I couldn't, and he said he got it for cheap for a couple hundred bucks. I couldn't picture it. And so I was imagining this thing. He, was, he kept bugging me about it. He kept saying, you know, you should do a project with my risograph. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. So finally I found some time. I had a project in mind. I was like, okay, this might work um, for, for this process. And he takes me to the space where he was storing the machine. It was a huge empty room. And um, he's like, I was looking around. There's an old yellowish 
kind of weird. It was almost like a bizarro world copy machine. The, the buttons were too big. The screen looked like a Game Boy. It was kind of yellowish. Uh, I was looking around for the Rezo. I was like, where's this crank screen printing machine? Where's this printing robot? And he was like, dude, the Rezo's right in front of you. And honestly, I was, I was a little disappointed. Um, but when I first opened up the front panel of the machine and pulled out the drum, that's when I was intrigued. It sort of had this sensation of, um, it reminded me of an old science fiction movie where you have to load up the nuclear warhead in the spaceship and turn the key at a certain point and make your way to the escape pod before the, um, you know, before it explodes. It, was, it sort of had that feeling, you know, crossed with being an administrative assistant in a 1980s um, office situation. So I, um, you know, I, I, I was like, okay, I did some test prints and then I came back and I was able to print an entire book in a day. I had been making artist books that were very labor intensive, which I had to sell for a considerable amount of money. And suddenly I was able to take my artist book publishing practice and scale it up and actually become a proper publisher, make editions, you know, of, of 100 or 200 or 300, sell them for prices that were affordable to other people like me and I could join the conversation um, in a different way than someone who works with other publishers. I could become the publishers and, and sort of launch my own press. And that's, that's basically what I did. I bought a Rezo and for several years um, after making prints on the machines of other artists, of other artists' Rezos, um, I bought a, I, I bought a um, risograph in 20, 2013, 2014, around then, uh, and basically started a press and started publishing other artists as well. So this has been, um, you know, this is sort of the groundwork that led to um, eventually starting the Rezo Lab. And, um, and, and so I'm teaching two classes. Um, and uh, the first one, is both of these classes take this knowledge, the groundwork that I that I've I you know what I learned with putting in years in printmaking and then also taking that and applying it to the risograph process, um, all of that basically I share with you in my classes. So the first class is a print design class. So this this class basically focuses on all the techniques, the the principles of printmaking, the idea of color separations. Um, overlapping colors, duotone, photographic processes, posterization, um, CMYK that goes into the process. This is some examples of, these are some examples of work made by students. Um, again, just so you can get a sense of the range of possibilities with risograph printing is really you can make anything. The only common denominator is that we're all working with the same set of colors. Um, you know, you can, the thing is you have to learn how to get your images to look like this. So, um, and it's, it's really been pretty amazing with these online classes, the, the connections that we've actually been able to make. This is all a big experiment. Um, and we didn't know if it was gonna work, but as it turns out, there's a whole lot that you can learn in preparing files for risograph printing. You can, you can actually apply this to your own design practice, even if, it, even if you never actually make a print, even if it doesn't become a physical thing. Um, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of approaching uh, how, to, how to build up an image with layers of color. That's kind of the idea. Um, in addition to a lot of examples and a lot of collaborative work. Um, and what we really try to do is it's, the classes take place on Canvas. So there's a, you know, we have weekly Zoom meetings, of course, but there, um, there's a place, every week there's a module that opens up with instructional videos, with handouts, with message boards for students to post their work and to comment on it. Um, it really becomes like a forum. And it's, it's amazing how that same sense of community that, that develops spontaneously in the Rezo Lab has actually um, seemed to develop with these online classes as well. So, and this is actually a mix of prints that were actually printed by students that have risographs because we tend to get a lot of students that already have risograph machines that want to figure out how to really optimize them, how to really uh, use them to their fullest potential. But also um, some of this work is actually 100% digital, but created with techniques that you would use to make a risograph print and with certain 
um, certain effects that actually can trick you into, into wondering whether or not it's actually a weasel print itself. We do try to break the fourth wall. So there's a number of collaborative projects that um, are printed either by the Weasel Lab staff or by students who, um, who have Rezograph machines themselves. So, um, you know, and, and this summer uh, we'll be able to kind of, kind of do both. So last summer the, the course was designed, these courses were designed with that in mind, but we didn't actually, the staff didn't have access to our space as of yet. So um, as it turns out, there were so many students that had machines that we were able to break up the class into different groups for, for those specific projects. Um, and there's also a zine class that I'm teaching. Both of these classes, you don't need any prior knowledge of resograph printing, of printmaking, even of Photoshop. Because honestly, the way that I um, present the use of Photoshop in my classes, um, it's a really, it's probably a different way of using, you, if you're familiar with, if you use Photoshop every day as a designer, as an artist, as a photographer, um, you, there's a good chance you don't use it in the way that I'm going to teach you how to use it. So more examples of, of collab. This is a collaborative project that was printed by um, three of the students from the zine class over the summer. And um, Afke, who she was, uh, she um, is based in Norway and has a press over there. And she printed this zine for, um, for her group. Um, and then they kind of presented it um, for, and uh, these classes over the summer, they're gonna be eight week classes. Um, for, for eight week classes, they're quite rigorous. There's a lot of assignments, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's obviously flexible, um, but there is sort of like a structure. So each week we learn a different technique and those techniques build on each, on each other. Um, and I've had, I've had a number of students say that they don't, they, that a lot of, a lot of the ways that they work um, in the class, they've been able to apply to different mediums. In the zine class particularly, I try to also give some background and context in terms of what a zine is, um, how we can trace it all the way back to the invention of the printing press and actually even before that, the invention of movable type, which came from China, not from Europe, even though this is Gutenberg here in the mid uh, 15th century. Um, Martin Luther, um, you know, William Blake, all of these precursors, the sci-fi fanzines in the 1940s, 30s, 50s, they were printed often with the mimeograph, which is a precursor to the Rizzo, um, the underground press in the 60s. You know, um, the, uh, a, lot of the, the, a lot of the political um, you know, imagery and independent publishing, the different, the different sort of impulses that go into the zine impulse, the impulse to sort of create your own platform, to get your message out there um, throughout the 20th century, really, but all the way back to um, the, the beginning of the, uh, um, or the middle of the, the second millennium. So that's a little bit about the Rizzo Lab and about my classes that I'm gonna be teaching. Um, and you're welcome at the end to ask any questions or you can even ask questions in the chat and we'll get to them um, as, you know, as we'll, we'll sort of let them pile up and then we'll, uh, we'll address them at the end of um, all the presentations. But I wanna turn it over to Suzanne, who's gonna talk about the class that she's teaching. So Suzanne, you can go ahead and take it away. Hi, um, hi everybody. I am Suzanne and I am teaching a class um, this summer, um, which is a creative writing class um, for visual artists or designers or illustrators or people who are more visual thinkers. Um, and it's Tuesday evenings beginning June 8th um, and goes through August 10th um, and it's all online. Um, there are live Zoom sessions and there will be um, readings and writing exercises to do on Canvas, um, but the live sessions will be um, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Um, I am a writer um, and a visual artist. Um, I um, Here's just like a little sample um, of some things that are recent. Um, I had a poem published recently in a, in a journal. Um, it's called Abilene. 
I have a piece that's coming out, a, a visual essay. I do a lot of things that aren't, um, they're sort of comics adjacent that um, involve writing and illustrations. Um, this running to somewhere piece, there are a couple of pages from this. This is a six page piece that's coming out in the magazine O Reader this summer. And it's a magazine for people who, you know, it's about reading books and um, loving books and what books mean. And this was about um, an encounter I had with a, a book in the first grade called From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweller. Um, and I probably would not be um, teaching this class or even living in New York if I had not encountered that book um, at that age, thanks to a teacher who read it out loud to our class, because um, I grew up in a little um, dusty town in Texas. Um, and then I've been recently making a lot of Instagram comics. Um, and the one here is um, one that I just posted the other day about um, sort of, you know, pets and falling in love with um, other people's pets on social media and what happens when one of those pets that you've fallen in love with gets sick or, or passes away. Um, so um, I like writing just for itself. I like writing with, uh, when I put it together with images and I like making just images by themselves. So I am kind of Jane of all trades on that stuff. And I do work professionally, like how I pay the rent um, and make time to write poems for little literary magazines and things as I work in advertising as a copywriter and I have for a long time and I'm used to working with art directors. So that's, you know, writing and working with images too, to tell stories. Um, and I did graduate from the MFA visual narrative program this past summer. Um, so the class is um, designed really for anybody at any level, like if you've never written before or you haven't written in a long time, or maybe um, you didn't love some of the writing classes that maybe you've had. I personally, um, when I set out to design this class, um, I wanted it to not be like a typical traditional writing workshop, which um, I find to really disempower um, writers because the typical way of doing that is that you crank out a bunch of stuff and your classmates review it. And while they're reviewing it, you're not allowed to say anything about um, any of it. You just have to sit there while they um, you know, pick your work apart um, when it might not be something that was written for that particular audience, or, you know, they, you may have done certain things the way you did them, um, for your, your reasons. Um, so I wanted to set this up as, as a way that, um, people could write and explore in a supportive environment, um, and share their work, um, and ask questions of, of other students about how they might, you know, if there's something that that's bothering them about, you know, the piece that they're working on, they can ask people and it can be much more of an exchange and not that sort of traditional um, critique structure that's often used in writing workshops. Um, so um, in the class, um, we'll, we'll explore sort of, you know, what makes, you know, what makes something a story like what are all of the, the things that go into um, making a story or a narrative, you know, all those sort of essential elements of creative writing, like character, plot, voice, point of view, um, style, and we'll explore short fiction forms and short nonfiction forms like essay or memoir or flash, um, flash essay, flash fiction, and also some poetry in the context of sort of learning about and, and exploring all of these um, creative writing elements. Um, there will be readings, you know, most writers do a lot of reading um, and the reason why they do, you know, most people love reading, but also it's like it, when you read enough, you can kind of lift the hood under uh, of that car and sort of see how they put it together. And it helps, um, it helps the writers write better um, to understand how other people put their stories together. So there will be a selection of, of short story, a short um, readings and some videos and, um, and writing exercises. There'll be writing exercises every week, um, writing exercises in class and um, things to do outside of class that are gonna be based on visual prompts um, that you yourself find. Um, and also I'll have some available um, but um, 
just really to start with something visual for those of us who are more visually oriented. Um, and by the end of the, of the course, you'll have a little portfolio of things that you've written. Um, you can try out different things. If you decide early on, you know, I really wanna be writing poetry for all of these things, and you certainly could do that. Um, and at the end, you're gonna pick one piece that you would develop and really polish and revise um, and make a zine or a mini chat book um, out of that. Um, I have taken a few classes myself um, and I really um, love working with visual prompts. Um, this is one that I wrote based on an old family photograph. Um, and it's just a little short piece, but to show you how like something like that can really spark um, a story Faye Laverne has just said something tart. I can hear it in the shape of her mouth, probably in reaction to something my father said. He must have been the one to snap the photo. Her cousin, Charlotte, my grandmother, who is sitting next to her and staring straight ahead, mouth set in a tight line, hated having her picture taken, always said no. Unless my father asked, and he must have flirted a little, called her Charlie, said something about how pretty she looked. So she took off her glasses, the ones that had the little rhinestones on the corner and were already out of style in 1973 and indulged him, but she's not really smiling. My grandmother is recently divorced. My grandfather had also been a smooth talker. He had talked to and done some other things with another woman, other women probably. My mother never told her why she threw my father out 10 years after he snapped this photo. Maybe she didn't need to. Maybe when my grandmother, grandmother was looking at what was in front of her, she already saw it coming. So this is just like something I, I think I did two drafts of it and all of it was prompted by that image. Um, and I wouldn't have just like thought to sit down and write something about that um, without having really kind of looked at and studied this image. So um, I think there are powerful tools, um, especially for those of us who are used to making images and looking at a lot of images. So um, all of the, the writing exercises in the class will be around photos or paintings or illustrations or um, you know, objects that you have. So um, that is, um, that's how that will be. And then final project, I love making zines um, and little books. Um, so you will pick a piece that, and we'll work on it together and get it polished up. And then um, you'll come away at the end with a cool little zine or a little mini chat book that you can share um, with other people, you know, maybe swap with people in the class by mail or um, send along to your friends, or um, you might have other, might want to um, submit it somewhere um, to a journal or something. And we'll talk about um, in the class, how to submit work, how to find places to submit your work, how to share, um, work that, that you've written. Um, and if you have any questions um, more, you know, you can ask them here or you can reach out to me separately by email um, at my email address. Um, and I'm also in, on Instagram if you wanna check out some more of my work um, and my website there. So I am going to stop sharing so that the next person can go. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, sorry, Suzanne. Um, so next up, um, we have another non Rizzo class, but um, another class that I think the common thread with all of these classes and with the Rizzo Lab, what ties it all together is that um, all of these classes sort of focus on narrative um, and different ways, different tools to kind of tell stories. So that's kind of the idea of empower you. Um, so next up, uh, Sarah is going to discuss her class. So you can go ahead and Take it away, Sarah. Great. Thanks, Pan. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen. All right. Oh, oops. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Shaw. Um, I am a comics artist and an illustrator, and I'm also um, a visual arts teacher, and I'm really excited to teach this class again. Um, I taught this class for the first time last semester, and it was a ton of fun. 
Um, it's called Graphic Memoir, Crafting Life Stories, and we focus on creating autobiographical comics and personal narrative. Um, this summer session will be on Wednesday evenings. Um, there are 10 sessions where we will meet on Zoom for two hours, and then there will be some other um, work asynchronous assignments to do outside of class. All right. Um, yeah, so this course consists of um, in-class drawing exercises. We normally start with some quick drawing exercises and then um, lectures and presentations and discussions with the class about different facets of making comics and specifically um, autobiographical comics. And then we also um, spend a lot of time looking at the work that we've made outside of class um, in at the beginning of the course in larger class um, critiques and feedback sessions. And then towards the end, when we work on one longer project, then um, we'll be in small breakout groups and have, have some more time to really delve into each student's work. Um, so outside of class, there are some readings and some weekly comics assignments for the first six weeks. And then for the last four weeks, there is a final project that is a bit of a longer um, narrative. So um, yeah, in the first six weeks, we really explore the language of comics and how to apply these techniques to your own story. Each week is... Um, we focus on a different topic and then um yeah and then we we look at a lot of different types of graphic memoirs um both web comics and um books comics in print and just explore a, a whole range of different visual styles and storytelling structures and then we'll take that knowledge and apply. Oh, and yeah, and, um, sorry. And so there are a lot of, um, in the first six weeks, there will be one separate comics assignment each week. So here's a few students work from, um, from last semester. And yeah, and then in the, the last four weeks, we'll work on following a process to create a longer narrative. And here's another example of a student's work um, from some beginning sketches and then um, a few pages of her finished comic. So this class is an opportunity to experiment, take risks, um, develop your creative problem solving skills and you know, take this time to really visualize your memories and experiences from new perspectives by creating um, comics about your life, um, making yourself into a character. It's a lot of fun. It's also um, really nice to teach this class online because we can interact with students from all over the world and um, bring those personal experiences into a class together which is really really fun and interesting um, last semester there was a student from london someone from shanghai um, and then you know students from all over the us as well so that really made it such a rich um, engaging environment where we could share all these stories together and especially you know during a time where we're still you know just kind of getting back out into the world again as as we knew it before um yeah so i can also share my um my email address with you all too in the chat after i stop sharing my screen but yeah, I'm excited to see you all in class again this summer. Um, for anyone who's interested in making autobiographical work um, in the form of comics. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I just want to mention, uh, yeah, I have been adding the, the links to these classes. So if you want to check out Suzanne's class, the sign up link is in the chat. Also, the link to all of the visual narrative classes um and sarah's class that i just posted so sarah um sarah's email is also in the chat if you want to reach out with some specific questions you can also feel you can also feel free to ask them at the end of the the session or just type your questions right now and we'll we'll kind of address them at the end um so the last presenter is going to be ren 
McDonald, who is teaching the mini comics class, um, also online. All these classes are online, by the way, except for the boot camps. And Ren is also teaching two boot camps. Um, he'll talk about that to kind of those of you that want to take the online class and then get access to the lab as quickly as possible, not have to wait until the fall where you can take our in-person 12-week CE classes, um, which by the way, will be at a smaller capacity of just five students with all the distancing and COVID protocols um, in place as well. But why don't you take it away, Ren, and you can share, share a little bit about what you're gonna be teaching this summer. Sure thing, thanks, Ben. Uh, hey everyone, thanks for sticking around. Uh, my name is Ren McDonald. I uh, teach the mini comics course at the Risa Lab here. Um, as Pan said, in addition to a couple boot camps coming up in person. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm a cartoonist. I'm an illustrator. Um, and I've been printing uh, with Risograph uh, for almost 10 years now. Um, I, I found a, a little old beat up one in, in Florida when I was living there, uh, and I've never looked back. Um, it's an incredible, uh, you know, machine uh, and, and way to self-publish work. Uh, so um, these are some of my comics, uh, some of my comics work, uh, and here's some of my illustration work. Um, if you guys want a better look at more recent stuff, I'd encourage you just to take a look at my website. Uh, these slides are a little bit dated. Um, but a little bit about the class. Um, so many comics, uh, just like a really obvious definition for anyone that's maybe not familiar um, are short comics that are typically self-published. Um, I haven't really seen many comics that are really longer than 24 pages or something around there. So, um, so they're a little bit on the shorter side uh, and there's a lot of advantages to that, uh, a lot of which we'll explore in the class. Um, so, uh, you know, many comics, like I said, they're typically short stories. I love short stories. I think they're a great opportunity to experiment. Um, you know, you don't have that commitment uh, that you may have with a longer book length project. Um, so you don't have to dedicate, uh, you know, a year of your life to, um, you know, an idea that you may want to take a chance on. Um, so I think mini comics are a really good opportunity to explore. Um, and, uh, there are also great ways to engage in the comics community, um, which the landscape has really been changing, you know, over the course of the last year and a half, uh, which has been pretty wild. But um, it's it's been really cool to see uh, how the community is really hung on, um, you know, with virtual fairs, with um, uh, online classes like we're doing here at Risa Lab uh, and stuff like that. Um, Virtual TCAF was just this weekend. I, I hope some of you were able to check it out. It was really cool. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, just like self-publishing, making mini comics, stuff like that, it's a really great uh, way to, uh, you know, add your voice to the conversation. Um, say what you need to say. Um, you know, it's, it's also a great way to participate in uh, just zine trajectory, a little bit uh, of what Pan touched on. Um, and, and mini comics surely follows that. And we'll dive deeper into that in the class as well. Um, and, and then, yeah, lastly, uh, I think one of the greatest things about mini comics is you're creating a physical art object. Um, and I think when it comes to self-publishing, uh, especially with the, the wonders of the internet, it, it's less and less important uh, to create physical objects. Um, just to get your ideas or your voice out there, um, you know, because obviously you can go on a, you can make your own website, you can self-publish or any, or uh, self-publish on social media, uh, stuff like that. So um, I think that it makes like zines and mini comics and stuff, uh, you know, they take on a new meeting, they, they become collectibles, they become art objects, which I think is really interesting too. Uh, so we'll dive into that. Uh, and then why is Risograph perfect for mini comics? It's literally perfect, uh, you guys. It, it's like the greatest um, answer to, to mini comics. And I think just self-publishing in general, it's fast, it's affordable. Uh, here at Risolab, um, you know, the class is online, but the boot camps are in person. Um, 
but at Rizzo Lab, the, the space is so incredible. Um, the facilities that we have are, are really incredible. Um, and, and yeah, just being able to take advantage of, of those machines in the space. Uh, and I have a lot of videos throughout the course, a lot of video content of me actually in the space printing uh, and walking you through how the entire process works. So you can actually get an idea um, of what it looks like. Um, even if you're not able to actually be in the space. Um, you know, the ink has a unique tactility that I think is rare in a world that's dominated by laser and inkjet printouts. Um, you can feel it on the paper. Um, uh, and, you know, limited color palettes, I, I think can really complement and add readability to the attractiveness of a comic. I'm a sucker for limited col colors in comics. Um, so yeah, it's, so all in all, it's perfect. Uh, trust me. Uh, and also, it's just cool. You know, Riso is cool. Riso printing is cool. Um, Riso printing mini comics. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Um, so the focus of the course, uh, it, it, we're going to go through Riso Graph printing basics, uh, zine production, uh, narrative-based comics, uh, self-publishing, and creating with intention. Um, what we'll be creating. So right off the bat, we'll drive, we'll dive into a single sheet zine, uh, a comic that way, just to loosen everyone up. Um, we'll walk through how to create Rezo ready print files. So at the end of the course, everything that you make um, should be ready to just uh, send right off. Uh, if you can come to the Rezo lab afterwards, um, you know, via uh, lab access or a boot camp, or um, or if you were to send it out to um, you know, uh, a print studio or something, they, sh they should be just totally ready to go. Um, but the main focus of the course is to create an eight to 16 page mini comic from start to finish. Um, and we go through a step-by-step -step process. So each week we'll be covering a different step in that, um, mini comic process. So starting with idea to outline, thumbnail sketching, uh, line work, color uh, covers, file setup, you know, and so on. Um, the, the structure, it's, it's 10 sessions long. Um, and because it's a little more, uh, or because it's online, it's a little more focused on the comic side of thing than the Rizzo side of thing. So I, I would say it's maybe like 60, 40 uh, with more of a focus on the comic side of things. Um, Every week, uh, we meet up for synchronous Zoom meetings uh, where we have lectures and group discussions, uh, chat about what everyone's reading, um, you know, what everyone's working on, uh, you know, anything that may be interesting that's happening, uh, you know, online or within the community. Um, and then there's asynchronous content uh, each week that includes video demos and uh, just uh, write-ups and notes and stuff like that uh, and files that you can take advantage of. Um, the beginning of the class, a little more rigorous with just going through, uh, you know, this is, uh, the step-by-step -step process. Uh, and then kind of the second half is more me stepping back and, and letting everyone really dive into the mini comic that you've started. So, so you have time to, um, uh, really bite off, uh, as much of a chunk of it as you can. Uh, and then we discuss everyone's progress, um, in class, um. So yeah, here's some past student work uh, from the in-person class. Um, it's so exciting, I think, to see what everyone works on each semester um, and to see everyone's just passion for comics. It, it's really incredible to me every single uh, semester that I teach this class to see at the end of the class, uh, you know, everyone has like a finished comic, uh, you know, just over the time span of a few weeks. Uh, and that always just blows me away. Uh, and it's really fun to watch uh, and inspiring. Um, but yeah, the class is fun. We're going to have fun. We're going to dive into Riso. We're going to dive into comics. Um, it's going to be cool. Uh, join me, won't you? <laughs> uh, and then just to touch on the summer boot camp, um, I, I'm doing two boot camps, uh, one in uh, June, a weekend in June, and one a weekend in July. The dates are here uh, on the screen. And the boot camps are not comics related. Uh, you can come in. We can talk about comics. You can print comics if you want to, but it will be more of a... Um, just kind of like a step-by-step -step process on uh, familiarizing everyone with the machines, how they work. Uh, and then I'll step back and kind of let uh, you all work on uh, whatever you want to work on, whatever you want to print. Um, 
The prerequisite, as Pan said before, is that uh, you've already taken either one of my or Pan's classes, uh, or you're currently enrolled in one of our classes. Um, yeah, and that's about it. So uh, I will throw my email in the chat uh, and, and definitely, uh, you know, put in the chat or a shout out if you have any questions or anything. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone. And thanks everyone for sticking around. I know Zoom can be uh, taxing if, if uh, you know, it can be great in small doses, but there's definitely a, a Zoom fatigue that we all, we all have experienced. So thanks for sticking around um, until this point. So um, we're, open, we're open to questions. Um, there's already a few in the chat. So one person asked about the question about the credits. So with credits, that usually has to do with some of the classes are uh, two credits versus three credits. Um, that's something that the continuing education department um, generally uh, deals with. So um, that usually has to do with the length of the class, but, um, but there are a couple of classes that are about the same length that seem to be different, different credits. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll you know, if, if you want to um, reach out, reach out to, to me, I'll type my email in and then I'll, look into that and get back to you. But usually that has to do with um, with the actual class itself and how long it is. So that, that's what I found. When we list classes that are longer, they usually, like full semester classes tend to be three credits. Um, as far as the boot camps, what I want to mention too is that you take the boot camp and then you get six weeks of access. So if you take the boot camp over the summer, um, the, the boot camps that Ren is teaching, the first one is right at the end of June, so that's going to be right before we actually open. That'll actually take place in a different room in the same building because our space is, they're doing some renovation. Um, but then you'll be able to come back after that weekend um, when, we, when we open a week and a half later, July 6th, and you'll be basically able to sign up for lab time. And I'll, I'll share the Reason Lab website um, in a sec just to kind of go over that process. Um, we have a sign up sheet. We have, um, we, have a, we have a forum on our site. You submit a request to access to print on a specific machine on a specific day and time. Everyone can print up to six hours a week, four hours at a time. And we've always had a very scheduled kind of, uh, we've had a system so that um, people reserve time on the machines. And so there, there's our, you know, often there's only um, about maximum of four or five people in the space, maybe four people printing on machines at the same time. And either a, um, one of our technicians or myself, I'm there uh, two days a week, I have office hours. Um, and so if anything comes up, if anything happens with the machine, there's always someone there to help you fix it. But the idea is you're totally self-sufficient. You, there's no limit on prints and masters, right? So this is totally unique to the Reason Lab. No other space does this. This is one thing I usually mention, but I didn't, is that we train you so that you've already made all your mistakes in class, or in this case in the boot camp, so that you can you then know how to make these experimental prints without taking 20 masters to make a four master print, right? Because you know how the machine is going to react to your designs and to your textures and all that. So you know how to get there faster. We've done the groundwork for you. You know, Ren and I each have you know about a decade of Rizzo printing under our belts, so we can kind of get you started and then you'll be able to, um, to print freely and not worry about, oh, I, I don't have enough money to, to pay for more masters or, you know, no, it's, it's all unlimited. It's very democratic. Um, everyone pays the same lab fee. Some people use it more, some people use it less. That's the philosophy of the Rizzo Lab. It's supposed to be a lab that you can actually use to experiment. Um, okay, other questions. In terms of the cost of the boot camps, they're 350. So while well, that breaks down to 175 for the lab fee, 175 for the tuition. And just to give you some context, normally in a normal semester for a full 12 week and change access to the lab, if you've taken a class previously in person, you know, normally you pay 350 and then you get full access to the lab. You can come and print during our open lab hours. Um, and for the summer, it's gonna be 200 normally for, for most, most students. So if you, if you take the boot camp, you're actually getting, um, you know, you're, you're getting a slightly cheaper uh, lab, lab fee. So 350 for, for the boot camp. Um, and the, the online courses are, I believe they're about 280. 
um, I have to double check because my class is a bit longer, but you can, um, I'll add the visual narrative, um, the page that has all of our classes listed. So you can, you can see we have all of those, um, we have all of those, all the boot camps and all the classes we, we presented tonight at that link. Um, more information regarding the fall sessions. Um, yeah, so for now, uh, yeah, we, we're, the boot camps are gonna be limited to five students in the summer. Uh, the fall classes, because we already have, we've already lined up the fall classes, they're also limited to five students. So this is a rare opportunity because usually we don't run classes with fewer than seven students. And usually our classes are packed. We have 14 students. Um, with my undergraduate classes, they used to be 20 students plus until I had the administration rein in the limit a little bit. Um, you know, uh, will registration be first come first serve? Yes. Um, so if you're worried about missing the opportunity, these, these classes do fill up. The online classes can have up to 20 students. Um, and, and I did have, I ha we have had some really packed classes um, over the last year. And, and they do feel that the two boot camps, the ones I'm teaching in the summer are already full. Another, another, uh, another consideration is that these online classes, they've been, we've been really happy with how successful they've been and, and satisfying, I think, both for me and, and for Ren, I think, to be able to connect with people all over the world. Um, as well as people that are local and will be interested in meeting some of the people that we work with over the last year. But they're not necessarily going to be offered forever. So we are going to be offering these online, the online classes in the fall. Um, and, you know, beyond that, we'll, we'll, we'll see because we, we, what we really want to focus on is our physical space. And um, as we come out of the pandemic, um, you know, finding a way to re reignite that energy that existed. And we've got hundreds of students that have been using and you know not even not even just matriculated students but professional designers art directors artists who uh, most of our students are not undergraduates by the way um, so you don't have to be enrolled at SBA to take these classes but if you look at the the people who print at the Rizal lab it's it's like a cross-section of various different art worlds in New York City it's people who are running galleries, people who are showing in galleries, people who are working professionally as illustrators, photographers, art directors, um, people that want to, you know, they want to find a different way to make work. Um, you know, so those people have been clamoring. Every week I've been getting a dozen emails since last March asking what the deal is, when we're going to reopen. So they're all dying to get back in. Um, you know, so so our focus is trying to is trying to um, figure out a way to rebuild rebuild the um, the community and sort of bring everyone back together again. So, if you're interested in taking an online class, I'd suggest that you you um, sign up for one of the classes this summer um, because it, it might be one of your one of your last chances. So, um, any other questions? Actually, there's something that I forgot to mention. Um, I, I think both me and, and Pan mentioned Photoshop and each semester that I do this class, um, there, there's a handful of people that are a little bit timid or haven't used Photoshop before or are more, more used to image making on other programs like, um, uh, I don't know, Clip Studio or Procreate. Um, or a number of other image making, uh, or, or they work traditionally, uh, and all of that is totally fine. Um, when uh, you are enrolled in the course, uh, you're able to have access to Adobe Creative Cloud uh, for the duration of the course. Uh, so you can download it and use it if you want. Um, and then the way that I approach all the demos that I do in Photoshop, um, I, I try to come at it from a, a position um, so that someone that's never used Photoshop before will be able to follow along and understand. Um, so, so yeah, don't, don't worry about the Photoshop stuff. We can figure that out. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a great point um, that, yeah, you get a free, you get a free creative cloud subscription. Um, and also in, at least in my class, and I believe in Ren did this uh, recently printed uh, a number of sample prints for students and then ship them out. So we're, we're hoping to do that again this summer. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so if you, 
you know, if you're curious, how do you how do you connect the digital realm of Zoom classes and Canvas and demos and, and, and working digitally with this physical print process? Um, we do both Ren and I, I think in our classes try to try to make that connection so that there's a possibility of having a physical print in your hands, whether you take this, the boot camp or whether you, you know, whether we ship out uh, a sample print to you um, with sort of like a care package at the end. So um, question about schedule. So I've definitely had some students who have had issues or have had conflicts with, with um, you know, with, with classes not, uh, you know, not happening at the right time. Um, at least in my class, um, there's a lot of, there's the Zoom classes are a great time to connect and to share, but we also do a lot of connecting in Canvas. Um, and I also, I've had students in different time zones that are staying up. Like I had a student in Morocco who, you know, at his time it was like three in the morning or something when, when the class, or four when the class is going on. I had a student in Singapore who would get up before, she was also an art professor and she would get up um, and take the class, probably her time it was like 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Um, so, but the classes are recorded. So if you're not able to make it in, you know, in, a given, in a given session, you can also check it out afterwards. Um, and there, you know, there's a lot of activity and discussion that happens on message boards and things like that on the Canvas platform. So, um, yeah, can I add something about that too, Pan? Um, yeah, in, in my class too, um, a lot happens on Canvas as well. Um, there are a lot of students responding to other students' work. Um, which is really awesome to see. The one thing that, and everything's recorded, the one thing you would really miss though is just interacting with the other students and getting feedback in person. Um, but there's so much, yeah, if you watch the recordings and also write on the messaging board, I think you also get a lot out of it. Yeah, my, um, my class will also be recorded. So, you know, I, you know, Obviously, it's you know it's great to be able to to be on the the live Zoom you know meetings, but it's not you know it's not required you know. And some people you know even the people who do go like everybody works, um, and some people are going to have to miss something sometimes. So you would be able to you know see the lecture um, you know that was recorded um, and contribute to the discussions on Canvas and the readings are going to be posted on Canvas um, and um, you know all those sort of conversations and materials would, would you would have access to those. Yeah, and another thing too, um, even um, some of the students in my last class too, like just really liked interacting with each other. So they even made their own group to continue sharing their work afterwards. Um, which is really cool too, and and can also happen in some of these online classes. Yeah, and I'll just add uh, with my class, I don't record it. So um, you know, my classes go from seven to nine. Uh, so if you can't, uh, you know, pop into the Zoom room until eight, uh, you would be missing quite a bit. I do provide notes uh, each week, so you can go back and look through the notes. Uh, and there is a fair amount of uh, engagement in Canvas on the discussion boards. Um, and of course, my email is always open. But yeah, so you keep that in mind for my class. I, I don't record the sessions. Are there any other questions before I hop over to the uh, visual narrative SVA continuing education page and, and also I want to show you the website, the Rizzo Lab too. Our brand new, well, as of last November, but still very new and fresh website. Any questions? All right. Um, let me just, if you are interested in um, signing up for a class, um, so, and we put this link in, the, I put this link in the, uh, in the chat, but this is, and you know, I love that this was actually, this is a part of uh, a poster that Ren designed when he was a, um, an artist in residence back in, I think it was 2017, 2018, um, that for advertising his workshop that kind of like captures the spirit of the lab, although we don't have binding robots yet, but we're working on it. Um, so, you know, we've got all our classes here. So if you want to check out Suzanne, uh, Suzanne's class, 
Sarah's class. Um, they have some other classes that are actually not from our department, but the boot camp, the boot camp intensive, the August one is booked. The June, um, the June boot camp and the July boot camp. These two boot camps have some spots in them still. And then uh, the other reason classes are at the bottom, so you can check them out here um, and sign up. For this price, there are uh, printers that are offering basically a one-day workshop. You know, for a little, you know, for around that same price, where, you, where they send you a print at the end. So, um, so it's really an amazing deal. You know, in terms of what you get, uh, eight to ten weeks of two to three hour classes, um, videos, all these resources, really comprehensive understanding of the process. And then as you, see, you know, as, as Ren mentioned, in both of our classes you'll end up with all the work that you made is designed to be both shareable as a digital image, but also printable. So it would work, you could send it to a Rezo printer and they could print it and it would come out, um, you know, it would, would be set up for printing because that's always a question people haven't done uh, printmaking or reso printing, they you know you have to learn how to set up your files. You have to learn how to set things up in layers and think about trapping and overlapping colors and knockouts and things like that. Um, and then our our beautiful website that um, we just put together is responsive too. So the logo, so the logo changes if you change the size or if you know different design, different uh, device. Um, we obviously we're not open yet, but um, we've got our hours. If you want to book time, well, so if you want to find out more about the space, you know, we've got a lot of images that sort of take you through what the space looks like, what kind of equipment we have, um, and all of the all the staff members. Links to our websites, our uh, technicians, faculty, and staff. Um, and also the artists and residents who've had an amazing, right now this has been paused, we're probably going to restart it in the spring, but we've had an amazing array of artists that have made work in our space. And you won't actually see, we've got, you know, you can expand these sections to check out the projects. And some of these artists, are, they're, they're quite uh, established, you know, in particular Pixie Liao, I feel like every other week she has a different museum exhibitions all you know in a different country um so there's another question uh and I'll, I'll i'll attend that in a second um but then if you you know we've got our courses pulled up here and in the future you'll be able to we've got the boot camps you'll be able to sign, we have an online portal. So once you have taken a course, you can go, you can use this link and easily sign up for lab access. Um, the system basically will, uh, will know if you've taken one of the prerequisites or not. So, um, and then as far as how, the, you know, the functional aspect of how the lab works, we have um, two different calendars basically for, um, for our two sets of machines. So Rezo's one through three all use the same drums. Rezo four uses a different set of drums. And the reason we have different calendars, and there's a, there's a reservation system down here. So you would basically type in your name, all your info, and request a certain time and day. And we get an email, and then if it works with the schedule, then we add, we add you to this Google Calendar that's embedded in our site. Um, and that's kind of how it works. Uh, of course, there's nothing on the schedule now, but if we go all the way back to, geez, at this point, um, all the way back to last, last winter, 2020, this is sort of what the, so you would look at the, you would look at the, um, the calendar and say, oh, there's a free spot here. Let me let me put in a, in a reservation for this machine. So you know, if if your reservation works, then we put you on the calendar, you get a notification. And um, that's 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 basically how it works. Um, so and then we have a little news section. Um, if you want to learn, learn various, we're, we're, we're going to be updating this more, but you know, some history on the evolution of the Rezo Lab logo, some of the inspiration for it, the Bauhaus 
designers and artists, the interior of the spaceship in the first alien movie, the NASA graphic identity, Bell Labs, and sort of how the, how the logo um, de developed. But basically, yeah. Oh, and then finally, of course, very important, the gallery. So we've got these print archives where we have, we're, we're trying to continuously add to these, but basically, you know, if you make a print, you know, it might end up in our archives and we might end up featuring it on, on our website. Um, we're, we're really trying to trying to become, um, we, we, you know, there's so much incredible work that's, shared, that's created in our space. We really want to share that with the world. And, uh, um, you know, just to give you a sense of what's possible with the process. So check out the site. You can spend a bit of time on your own. Um, let me just, there was this one sort of extensive question. I, I can address the, the question a little bit um, while you look through it. But um, I, I think there's like a few things that uh, Alexandria is asking about here. Um, but I think the main question is uh, what impact uh, learning reso has on the students. Um, and yeah, I'd say it has, uh, quite a large impact. I know that like a lot of students that, that go through the course, um, both IRL uh, in real life and, um, virtual, um, you know, I, I see, uh, the way that these students are approaching work now, if they email me about it, or if I see them on social media or anything, um, there's definitely like an approach uh, for my students who took the mini comics class at least. Um, of it's like the process of printing. It, it's kind of specific, right? It, it, there's all these like kind of limitations that you have to go through. You have to set things up a certain way. Um, and I think that sometimes limitations uh, can really induce uh, productivity or creativity. And I, I see a lot of people after they learn the limitations of resograph taking those limitations into their practice afterwards, uh, whether it be reso printing or not, um, just because it, it's kind of uh, comfortable to kind of have those uh, barriers at times, I think. Um, and then just speaking from my own experience, um, I know that like once I started uh, learning Riso and like setting up my files uh, digitally to be printed uh, and everything else, um, it really impacted the way that I, that I work, um, you know, in Photoshop and everything else. Uh, I really, um, you know, started using almost exclusively uh, limited color. Uh, and a lot of my digital work uh, is actually set up in a way that it could be printed uh, via Rezo if I wanted it to be. Um, so it's kind of like, um, you know, once you, uh, what's the saying? Like you, you get bitten by the bug or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, especially for me, once I got a taste of it, like I, I just couldn't let it go. Um, and, and it's really just informed my entire practice, um, obviously. Um, so yeah, and, and then just uh, what's the point of taking the step uh, of learning Riso uh, if there's such a learning curve? I actually wouldn't say there is a huge learning curve. It, it seems complicated at first, but it, the entire process is actually pretty simple. Um, so, uh, and then what's the point? I, I don't know. It's like uh, nothing worth doing is easy, right? So yeah, just just go for it. And, and it's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's a really cool um, process to learn. And even if, you know, you don't get hooked on it in the way some other people do is now, you know, you know, now, now you've gone through that process and now you know um, that you maybe you don't like it. And, and that can inform your uh, practice, you know, in, in a totally different way. So um, so yeah, there's there's lots of points. Do it. Take the jump. Take the leap. <laughs> I, I, would, I, I would like, oh, sorry, did someone have a question? Alex? Did someone have a, yeah, go ahead. Um, I would I would definitely second that point. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the great things about making, having, making work for a medium, uh, you know, pre-making based meeting, especially Rezo, are the limitations. I mean, I think that we need limitations, especially we have so many ways to make images. We have such where our image making tools are just, you know, we're super powered. And that can be kind of crippling. If you have too many options, what do you choose? You know, so I think it's good to artificially to, to create artificial constraints. 
And that's a kind of discipline that you can use to focus what you want to do because you can't do everything. You can't use all the colors. You shouldn't use all the colors, you know? So if you're able to focus with these limitations because you have to, then you'll end up um, having a more disciplined approach and make really making better work. So um, yeah, def definitely 100% agree with everything that Ren said. And, and I've had a lot of students um, you know, come to back to me and say that it really changed their practice in across the board, not just with printing. Um, I really feel like with both both of all the Rizzo classes that we're offering, you could you could take these classes and never touch a Rizzo and get um, get a ton out of out of them. Um, that will really change your practice and your thinking um, in a lot of different ways. The hours for the Rizzo Lab access this summer. Um, we're right now it's still it's you know it's still tentative, but looks like we're going to be open on Mondays, Thursdays, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we'll be open five days a week. We'll be closed Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, we may expand. We may open up the middle of the week um, if, um, you know, if, if we get a surge of, right now we have about 20 former students that have already signed up for open lab access. The two boot camps are full. Um, I'm, I'm expecting the other ones to flow as well. So that right, up, right off the bat, that's uh, it's 40 people who will be able to use the space this summer. So we'll, we'll, we will likely have to open up those extra hour, those extra days, um, just to make sure we can accommodate everyone. Um, let's see, any other questions, comments, concerns? Anything anyone wants to share? Any of the instructors have any other final, final comments or things you want to add? See you in class. All right, well, um, I, I'll second that as well. I'm gonna just add, I know I've been adding the link in the chat a bunch, but just one last time, I'm gonna add it to sign up and then the Rizzo Lab website as well. And if you want it, if you want to email, I'm gonna be sending a follow-up email to everyone who attended tonight and also everyone else who, um, various people who weren't able to make it um uh and so registration is open now so you can sign up now um and classes start in about three weeks i think if i have my uh my timing right so thank you all for joining us and hopefully we'll see you online and eventually potentially irl um, enjoy the rest of your evening and if you have any questions feel free to email either tonight or um, you know, or later on when I send the follow-up email with a link to the recording of tonight's info session. So um, all right everyone have have a great have a great night and hopefully we'll see you soon.